Okay, uh, let's now talk about some quick announcement. Your programming test number two is gonna happen tomorrow, as we announced. So tomorrow, the same time for the schedule lab, the same coverage, the same policy. If you got any trouble, you still got the office hour today and also tomorrow to speak to me if you got any uh, doubts about the technical coverage. And for your lab number four, that one is about inheritance. I think you're ready to actually do the lab. You already know how to use the extends keyword and also the super keyword. You, you can definitely try to complete it. And lab number four, just a little bit look ahead, is going to be the basis for your final programming test. Programming test number three. Not tomorrow, but in about three weeks time. You just make sure you master the subjects that's covered in the lab. And then we'll, as usual, we're gonna give you, uh, give you some solution walkthrough uh, once the uh, submission deadline is over. But you should definitely try by yourself. Okay, do we have any questions about the course in general? Okay, right? Okay, today we're gonna go continue with the inheritance, but it's really important to have a quick recap about what we did last Wednesday. And we go back a little bit, I just want to show you some critical pages that make sh making sure that you're fine, right? Of course, if you got any doubts, you should really review uh, the lecture recording. Number one, you want to really understand this table over here. Once we have declared the so-called static types of the variable, you can determine the so-called expectation. For example, this expectation, the expectation for this variable declared as students will be different from this variable here declared as resident students. And you want to make sure you know precisely how to determine the expectation. And we'll go further today to generalize the so-called substitution rules. That's gonna make it very mechanical for you to determine if some code fragments should really compile. That's something we'll get into today, but we'll get there. And we talk about two intuitive ideas. One is about polymorphism, and the other one is about dynamic bonding over here. Just make sure you actually review them as well. They will also be useful for the later lecture. And we also gave you some quick summary about how you should really use the different notions of types. We'll de definitely dive into the notion of static type and also dynamic types today as well. And the principle will be just always remember, if the question really is about whether a line will actually compile in that case, only look at a static type. If the question is more about the runtime behavior, for example, which version of the method should be invoked, most likely only dynamic type. When I say most likely, in some exceptional cases, you may also need to look at a static type, but we'll see example later. But for now, this page summarizes what you really need to keep in mind when you do the uh, question for your written test or in the exam. Of course, beyond this course, you want to make sure you can do that too. All right, that's about a quick recap from what we did last Wednesday. And today, we're gonna continue. And we already saw this so-called multi-level inheritance hierarchy over here, the student hierarchy and the smartphone hierarchy. And as you see the notes, I got some little exercises for you about reflection. Let me just explain how you can do it. Remember, we talk about the three different designs. If you remember for design number one, it's really about using the kind attributes. And for design number two, it's really about having duplicates, right? Student, resident, student, non-resident, student. We've got two different designs without using inheritance. And design number three is really about using the super and extends keyword. And I would say it would be very nice for you to actually think about if you're given this particular multi-level inheritance, how would you do it using design number one? What kinds of uh, objects do you have to enumerate for the integer value? That's number one. And for design number two, in that case, if you actually want to have a student management system, how many arrays do you need for the kinds of students? In the case of uh, the original student, resident student, and non-resident student, we need two arrays. But what about here? Okay, that's another exercise for you to think about. And for design number three, the top class student here should really store what's really in common among all the subclasses. Similarly, the domestic student should also store the common attributes and methods among its subclasses and etc. So these are the more like a reflection for you to think about for the different design, okay? Think about it. And 
the same thing for the smartphone. We briefly walked through the smartphone hierarchy and we're gonna dive into more details today by using the examples. And there will be some little exercise we can do right away. Maybe that can also nicely summarize what we learned from last time. And we talk about expectation, right? Expectation is really important over here. This will be the kind of uh, sketch you will have to do very often when you do either the programming test or the written test or, either, uh, or the exam. Let's say this. The problem is we want to compare the different ranges of expectation of these three classes. And you can see iPhone 13 Pro is over here. Huawei P50 Pro is over here. Galaxy S21 Plus is over here. We talk about these three classes. We want to know if we declare some reference variable of this type versus this type versus this type. What's gonna be the consequent uh, expectations, right? Let's sketch the idea very quickly, and we've still got other examples to show to you. Every time you are facing this kind of question, I would say, look at the hierarchy, identify where the classes are for the static types. The first one, we have, you can see here, let me be consistent with the color here, iPhone 13 Pro, which is over here. And then we got another class, which is a Huawei phone, which is over here. And we just got another one, Galaxy S21 Plus over here. Number one, you can see these three classes exist in different places in the hierarchy. So they must have different expectation, number one. Number two, what are they exactly? Let's take this one, for example. If you look at iPhone 13 Pro, what would be the precise expectation? If you declare, for example, if I have over here, I say iPhone 13 Pro, and then I'll just say P, standing for phone. If I just declare this particular reference variable, and of course, imagine that I actually uh, initialize the object, so it's not, there's no null pointer exception. And then later on, if I say p dot, and there should be a range of expectation, like attributes and methods, what are they, right? And yeah, I know you guys may want to answer, but let me help you with the initial one, right? The best way to do is like this. Follow the parent. iPhone 13 Pro has the parent iOS. iOS also has its parent smartphone. Only these three classes are relevant for us to determine the answer. Sibling, not relevant. Uncles, maybe, uh, and also other siblings, they're also not relevant, okay? So what we should really look at would be, let me just highlight them. This class over here, and also its parents, and also its parents. All the attributes and methods are determined from here. Okay, and can anybody tell me what would be the valid expectation based on the three classes I just outlined? Ferris, go ahead. Exactly. So now, uh, let's be a little bit more careful here. Quick take for sure. So you can see quick take. And to be more precise, the quick take is a new method that we just introduced in this class. And also, if you go up, you got surf web, also you got FaceTime. And now, I want you to look at this. Surf web and also FaceTime. For FaceTime, it's only introduced in the iOS. FaceTime was not a method that was declared in the smartphone, right? It's a new method. And for the surf web over here, it already exists in the smartphone. In this case, we actually got two versions, right? You can see we got version number one and version number two. You can see this surf web is version number one. This surf web over here is version number two, okay? And later today, we're gonna talk about dynamic types. If you have a context object with the dynamic type iPhone 13 Pro, according to dynamic binding, it's actually going to call the version that's actually declared over here. In this case, iPhone 13 Pro inherited version two, which overrides version one. 
in this case, only version two will be called. Just remember that. That's something we'll actually see later, also for the equals method, okay? I'm gonna write this down as an observation. That's something you have to make sure you know how to do. If the dynamic type is iPhone 13 Pro, version number two of the surf web is invoke. And visually, I can tell you that it's actually very easy to judge. When you actually got multiple versions that might be inherited to the same class, choose the closest one. Version two is closer to this class as opposed to V1, that is further. Okay, that's kind of the key, all right? That's only some intuition I wanna to give to you at the front, but we'll elaborate some points as we go. All right, so that's about the first one here. And then for the other two, I would suggest you guys did it as exercise for yourself, okay? Exercise. Okay, you, can, you, don't, need to, you don't even need to write down anything. Just think, think in your mind what should be the corresponding attributes and methods. Think about it. All right, so that's the uh, multi-level hierarchy. And let's now dive into a little bit dry part for today's lecture. We need to go over some bullet points and then understand, understand some general rules. Bear with me. After the general rules, just for two or three slides, and then we're gonna go over many examples and we'll take a little break before we dive into dynamic type, okay? Don't fall asleep, all right? It's gonna be uh, important. Okay, inheritance forms a type hierarchy, right? Data type is something we talk about. It's more just about set of runtime values. Can be integer, can be Boolean, can be string, can be any reference type, okay? And in the case of the reference type, a class, for example, point V1, or maybe vaccine, whatever class you have, it's just a set of references you might take. And we have a, something called inheritance hierarchy. Let me show you something here right away. This is a very general form of the inheritance hierarchy. Think about this is more like the top. Somewhere we got A. For A, you can find A's parents, A's grandparents, A, A's grand -grand grandparents, all the way to the top, all right? And also under A, A also maybe has some child classes over here, maybe it has two children. Under that, we also got different descendants over here. That's a general form. In your subsequent course to this, which is 2011, about data structure, you will learn more about the data structure called tree. But I think uh, in this course, you will need to understand, at least in the intuitive level, how the tree will look like. I'll try to give you intuition by example. It shouldn't be too bad. We don't need any formal introduction to the tree. That's enough. Okay. And something we already said in the, uh, in the object equality lecture, the root of the hierarchy is object. That means in Java, even though we don't see that explicitly, but just remember every class has object as its parents, but it's very implicit. You never say, I want to create a class extends object. You never say that. You, I don't think it's even allowed, okay? And now here comes the critical point. Whenever you try to visualize the hierarchy, or you try to write down some class extends another class, it corresponds to some operal error, for example. If you think about A here, and up or arrow over here points to another class, that means class A extends this particular class, all right? Also, this class extends this class, and et cetera, okay? That's kind of the, between the visual and textual you want to know first. And it's transitive. What does it really mean? For example, A extends this class over here. Oh, let me just name them. Let's say this is class B, this is class C, all right? A extends B, B extends C. We can also say implicitly A extends C as well, right? Pretty much like an A larger than B, B larger than C. So we know A larger than C, right? Transitive. Also very straightforward. All right, and let's now talk about a very important notion about ancestor and descendants. Once we introduce to you these terms, we'll do some example, and later on the rules are going to be defined in terms of ancestor and descendants, right? Let's understand the definition first. 
Let's start with ancestor. Given a class A, what would be the ancestor classes of A? It could be multiple. It would be A itself. It's really important to know A would be its ancestor, right? And then go upwards. It would be A itself and all the classes that A either directly or indirectly extends. Remember transitivity, right? So let's take a look. If you look at here, A itself, A extends uh, B, B extends C, and all the way to over here, right? That would be the ancestor. Okay, let me highlight it. Think about this part over here, including A all the way to the root. So these would be the ancestor of A. And let's go back to the smartphone example right away. What I did earlier was to figure out what the ancestors are for this particular class. You can see iPhone 13 Pro itself, its parents, iOS, its grandparents, smartphone. So these are the ancestor classes for iPhone 13 Pro, right? Ancestor class is very important, uh, very simple concept. And what's so important about identifying the ancestor classes. So number one, uh, what well, the critical point, A inherits all the code, including attributes and methods from its ancestor classes. For example, let's say, if you have, for example, let's say method M1 declare over here, you have some method that's newly declared M2 and also M3. That means M1, M2, M3, all of them will be inherited to A as well. Right? That's something we knew already from last time. That's what it means. And what's the consequence of this? Let's look at the next bullet point. A has wider range of expected usages than its uh, ancestor classes. What does it mean? What does it really mean? For example, let's say we have this. If you compare this class B here and compare A over here, Okay, look at that just for example. B is an ancestor of A. What does that imply? That imply A has wider range of expectation. You can see here, A will inherit everything that's in B plus maybe some additional methods. So here we might decide in A, we just want to introduce another method maybe called M4. That's something you can do. You can always introduce new attributes or new methods into the class. A has wider range of expectation than B. For example, in this case, we got M4, the new method. All right, hopefully so far you're still following, okay? And what about descendant classes? It's the symmetric notion. But notice that when we say descendant classes of A, he also includes A. So some remark right away. A would be the ancestor and descendants of itself. It's just our definition, all right? Including A, and also all the classes that directly or indirectly extends A. What does that mean? Let's look at that. If you look at the same class A over here, we just talked about the ancestor classes. What about descendants? It's all the classes below A. These will be the classes, including A. So let me try to highlight it. Think about A here, A's children, grandchildren, and etc. Okay, over here. So these would be the descendant classes. Descendant classes of A. And what can we say about the descendant classes of A? Similar. Basically, whatever you have in A will be inherited to all the descendant classes. What does it mean? For example, you can see we already said A has wider expectation than B. Similarly, all the descendant classes of A over here has wider range of expectation than A. For example, maybe somewhere at the very bottom over here, let's say, 
if you have a class over here, let's say, somewhere over here, in this one here, it has a wider range of expectation than A, because you can always define maybe some new method, for example, you might just define some new method M5, right? Ask any question about the definition before we do examples, right? Conceptually, they are not difficult. You just gotta remember ancestor versus descendants, and also give it any class, it is also its ancestor and descendant at the same time, all right? And one more thing to say, whenever you talk about ancestor, over here, ancestor has the same or less expectation because A has just the same expectation as itself. Anyone above over here has less expectation, like a few methods you can expect. On the other hand, if you talk about all the descendant classes, they have the same or more expectation. That's a concluding remark for this definition here. All right, and we're gonna do example. Okay, so let me just try to do uh, a little bit more bullet points and we'll do a concrete example. The lower a class is in the type hierarchy, that means it's more like a descending class, is the more code it accumulates. That means more expectation, wider expectation. Because they can just define new attributes and new methods. Also, they may also overwrite the existing method that's inherited from the parents. Let's now do some example. Just one. All right, smartphone. Okay, let's say this is the hierarchy here and we're talking about smartphone, iPhone 13 Pro, and this Galaxy S21. Let's say these are the three classes we have, okay? Why don't we do them very quickly, okay? Let's start with this. What would be, how many, how many ancestor classes do we have for this class? How many, first of all? Three or four? Four. Itself? Parents, 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 good. Let's write it down, oh, beg your pardon. Right, it will be itself. I'll just say S21, so you will know I'm talking about this class, and also Samsung. And then this one here, Android, and also smartphone. Okay, and let's only do this one for expectation. What would be the expectation? For this class over here, the whole range of expectation. Farah's already answered. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Dial. I like that what you say is the overridden version. Absolutely. Let me write it down for this one here. The expectation would be so we start with this itself does not declare any new method, that's okay. But it's gonna inherit everything from its parents, for example, size sync. So it de definitely has size sync. And then it has Skype and surf web. Skype and also surf web. And notice that the surf web over here is the overridden version compared with the initial version on the smartphone, right? That's the overridden version. And then also we got dial. Okay, good. Let's do just one more, which is important, one more. Let's now talk about this one here. Before we do the exercise, here's my question. If I look at this class over here and this class over here, will they share any expectation in common? The answer is they will, but what exactly will they be? Well, for example, you can see they don't have face one has FaceTime, the other one doesn't, but one has Skype and the other one doesn't. Definitely they don't share this one. Where can we identify the parent class where they share the expectation from? Yes? Smartphone, okay, but can anybody kind of try to make this very general as a rule for us to find out? Given two classes in the hierarchy, how do we know exactly where they inherit all the common expectation from? Josh. 
common ancestor. I like it. What to be more precise, the lowest common ancestor. I agree. Right? It's a very important point also here to see. Okay, so you can see if I cut this class here, and this class over here, and this class over here. Okay, so you can think about these two classes over here. They share expectation inherited from their lowest common ancestor. And I'll illustrate to you visually what it means. Okay, I'll just highlight it first. Lowest common ancestor. Okay, let's think about it. Let's start at the same time. Its parents, not common. This one, its parents, also not common. But their parents over here, they are common. So that's why it's the lowest. All right? They're going to share everything just from there. So when you actually do, uh, let me just write this down so we can see one more time, confirm. Let's say we still talk about this class over here. Ancestor will be iPhone 13 Pro, iOS, and smartphone. iPhone 13 Pro itself, iOS, and also smartphone. And apparently, just from the text, you can see already smartphone and iPhone. So this is the lowest common ancestor. Lowest common ancestor. Okay, let me do a little bit more. What about expectation? It's going to be cake, FaceTime, overrated version of Surf Web, and also dial. Quick take, yeah, bear with me. Quick take, and also FaceTime, Surf Web, which is the overridden version. And also dial. And the only thing they share in comments is over here. You might be wondering, well, since you said Surf Web and Surf Web, Aren't they just overridden? But even though they're overridden, there are two different versions for the overriding. One is over here, the other one is over here. They're different. Just don't get confused. So this part here tells you that's what they share in common due to their lowest common ancestor. Okay, so this is the expectation from the lowest common ancestor. All right, and quick question. What will be the descendants of this? One. Just one, right? Just itself, exactly. That's already at the bottom, okay? And quick check. What will be the class in the hierarchy that has the most, the largest number of descendants? Ferrets? Oh, yeah, this, this hierarchy here. But when you say object, that's actually right, because object has basically every class is its descendants, of course. But how about this hierarchy? Smartphone, the top of the hierarchy, right? And just note that as well. The top of hierarchy has the most descendants. Okay, good. Uh, let me see here. And for this one, exercise for you. You can also think about it. If you are not really exactly sure, I'll put exercise over here to figure out the ancestor expectation descendants. Okay. And let me see what the next one is. Okay, that one's fine. Okay, now we should be very ready to talk about uh, substitution. Okay, let me just illustrate uh, a few more bullet points and then we'll get to the rule. So now, when being used as a context object, instances of a class, a classes, descending classes, have a wider range of expected, uh, expected usages. That's something we said, right? In the descending classes, they just got wider use of, a wider range of uh, expectation. And this part is a little bit tricky. I'll read it, but I'll try to give you an example as well. Given some reference variable, and we may substitute it, and we'll see exactly how substitution can be done. It's just by done doing variable assignment. We'll see. 
and into an object of, of any of its, uh, its descending classes. For example, let's say here, okay? Let's say we declare SP1, smartphone 1, smartphone 2, and smartphone 3. You can see static type, smartphone, over here, iPhone 13 Pro, over here, and Samsung, which is over here, all right? And here, we want to work out if I say SP1 is assigned to some variable over here, can I say, well, basically, let me just talk about this one here. Right, these are all the three possibility, okay? Can I say SP1 is assigned to SP1? That might actually quite obvious, right? We can do that, but why? The way to think about this is like this. You can think about SP1 and SP1. Look at the static type. SP1 over here was declared to be a smartphone. SP1 over here is also declared as a smartphone, okay? And if you recall what we said about the intuition for the polymorphism, that's something you can definitely review, maybe after today. If I allowed SP1 is assigned to SP1, in that case, will I be able to satisfy the expectation on this original SP1? The answer is yes, because SP1 over here is over here. Smartphone can satisfy itself for the expectation. That one is actually quite trivial. Why don't we look at the second one here? If I say here SP1 is assigned to SP2, would that be okay? That's kind of uh, the choice we made last time. If you try to look at this, SP1 is assigned to SP2. SP1 still is a smartphone over here. What about SP2? It is iPhone 13 Pro. So what you ask, want to ask yourself is, if I allowed this variable assignment to happen, can SP2, which is an iPhone 13 Pro, satisfy the expectation for SP1, which is a smartphone? Think very intuitively. If I tell you I want a smartphone, you give me an iPhone 13 Pro. That should be okay. On the other hand, if I tell you that I want an iPhone 13 Pro, can you just give me a smartphone? No, because the one you give to me could be maybe a Samsung, which is not what I want, right? That's kind of uh, the exercise we need to keep doing, right? So for this one here, so you can see this one's okay, this one's okay, this one's okay, okay? One more example here. Now, if I got SP2 on the left-hand side, SP2, and SP2, right? It's assigned to, let's put all the possibility, SP1, SP2, SP3, okay? Like that. Let's do the, this exercise and then we'll see the general rule, okay? In order for you to decide, what you gotta do is look at the static type. This one's trivial. You can always assign something to itself. That one's okay, let's not bother, okay? How about these two? Are they valid or not? Exactly. Yes, I like your explanation, very good, thank you. Let me just repeat it quickly. SP1 is a smartphone. SP2, is an iPhone 13 Pro. If you allowed this variable assignment to occur, that means you think smartphone can satisfy the expectation on iPhone 13 Pro, which is not right. Because iPhone 13 Pro, for example, has a very spe special method called quick take, which cannot be done, which cannot be fulfilled by smartphone over here, right? As you can see from the hierarchy. So this one is not good, all right? And this one is not good either. And the, the slide I'm just about to present is going to summarize this as a mechanical rule for you to check. Let me just give, give you a little bit rehearsal, okay? When I look at this one here, SP1 has a static type smartphone over here. And SP2 on the left-hand side has the static type 
iPhone 13 Pro, which is over here. Remember, this is the right-hand side. This is the left-hand side. In order for this variable assignment to really compile, the, left -hand the right hand side must be a descendant class of the, the left hand side so that it can satisfy all the expectation from the left hand side. That's the rule you will see. Okay? So after today, once I present to you the rule and also example, think very carefully about what's happening over here. Right? Everything kind of follows just the expectation as we have been talking about. Okay, let me just go over some slide over here. I think I got a little bit more uh, exercise over here. That's just about expectation. Okay, this one I can just do just one more page, right? That's just here. Just a little bit more. Okay, just do one. If you see this, let me look, only look at this. Okay, if you look at this hierarchy again. If I declare P1 to be smartphone and also P2 to be Samsung, P1 and P2, all right? Now, if you compare where their static types are, P1's static type is here. P2's static type is Samsung over here. Apparently, their expectation over here would be different, right? And let's now try to work out very quickly. So if I say P1 dot, what will be available for me to call pound? Only dial and surf web, nothing else. That's at already the top, okay? That'll be uh, dial and surf web, version number one, non overridden. Dial and also surf web. What about P2 over here, Samsung? Because smartphone over here is uh, ancestor class of Samsung, whatever that's expected on the ancestor can also be expected here, number one. So we also got dial and also surf web. And what's more to P2? Whatever that's newly declared, including SciSync and also Skype. Yeah, this one's rather easy, so I wouldn't really involve you, you know, to give me the answer. We can save some time. And one more thing to note, and then we can move on. Notice that the surf web over here and the surf web over here, okay? Are they the same version? Okay, they are not. Because for smartphone here, the version is not overridden, just the original version. And for P2 over here, which would be Samsung, that's the overridden version. Okay, good. Okay, that's enough. Let's look at the rule. All right, this part here, just to kind of review what variable assignment really means for reference variable. If you say V1 is assigned to V2, we copy the address of V2 onto V1, and visually, that's what it means, right? We know this very well. And what you have to really check is the static type of V2. Can it satisfy the expectation of the static type of V1? That's basically the rule, okay? Let's look at the rule, and then we'll do examples. Okay, so here, whenever you're expecting some objects of uh, static type A, it would be okay to substitute it by its descendant class because the descendant class can do just at least as much as class A, okay? That's the uh, justification I just mentioned, but let's now look at some quick example. You can decide right away. And let's see if you can make it more mechanical. Oh, Ferris, you got a question. Go ahead. Uh, let's try right away. Let's try it right away. Ferris was suggesting, you mean SE and also iPhone 13 Pro? Yeah. Okay, let's do that right away. So let's say if you got iPhone SE, I'll say SE over here. And also we got iPhone 13 Pro. And I'll just say uh, Pro over here. 
Let's try both. SE is assigned to pro versus pro is assigned to SE. Right? Number one and number two. Okay? So guys, let me help you a little bit. It's only our first time doing things mechanically. Okay? In order to determine whether or not this should compile, okay, you want to look at a static type for pro. Look at a static type for SE. And then try to see whether the static type over here is a descending class of the static type over here. If it is, then it compiles. If it is not, it does not compile. It's that simple. So Ferris, what will be your answer? To be no. Okay, let's look, let's take a look. If you look at that, iPhone 13 Pro has a static type over here. And for SE, that's its static type. And what you want to ask is whether or not the static type of this is a descending class of the static type of this. Meaning, is this a descending class of that? No, it is not. So it wouldn't compile. Okay? I'll write this down, okay, over here. Is the static type of Pro, which is iPhone 13 Pro, iPhone 13 Pro, a descendants of the static type of SE. In this case, it is iPhone SE. Right? That's really the complete sentence to actually uh, phrase. So iPhone 13 Pro and also iPhone SE. Is this a descending class of that? No. And vice versa. So that's why both of them should fail. All right? Can we just do this very quickly? Here, let's say we got SP1, SP2, SP3. All right? Now, can you quickly determine, is this okay? Well, for this one here, SP2, static type, iPhone SE. SP1, iOS. Is this a descending class of that? It is. That's fine. Similarly, SP1, SP3. SP1 is still over here. SP3 on the right-hand side has iPhone 13 Pro, which is also lower. Is this a descending class of that? It is, right? Good. If you agree, that's a good sign. So you can see what we have been really trying to do in the past, to, uh, including today's lecture. We try to explain to you very, in very much detail how the rules were somehow derived. So you will know about the descending classes can be substituted for its parent class because it got more expectation. And now we want you to be quicker without thinking too much about the rationale. You can just determine right away. All right, so these are two levels of thinking. All right, quick exercise over here. Now, is SP1 assigned to SP2 valid? No, right away, right? Now let's take a look. You can see here, SP2 has the static type smartphone. Okay, so this is a static type of SP2. And it's the right-hand side. And I got SP1 declared as iOS. Static type is iOS. Okay, you can see that's the static type of SP1. And that's the left-hand side of the variable assignment. So now, is this a descending class of that? No. That's why it would be invalid. Okay, very good. How about this? This one is actually even worse. Because when you try to assign this to this, somehow you are still kind of in the ancestor path for this, for the, this class over here. But when you're trying to do this, SP1, SP2, you can see iOS is actually here. Huawei is actually here. They belong to simply different branches. One is Android, the other one is iOS. So there's no way they are compatible. Right? So that's why it's also cross. And of course, if you want to do, uh, do a little bit more detail, SP2 
is over here, Huawei. This is static type of SP2. And SP1 is over here, iOS. Static type of SP1. Is this a descendant class of that? No, right? That, absolutely not. The descendant class of this would just be this part over here, right? As we just did the exercise about. So that's also no. Okay, good. Are we okay so far? It's a little bit dry, and also it's very uh, kind of mechanical. Of course, you want to also understand the rationale, which we try to give you intuition about uh, last time. Okay. All right, this part's already covered, so we are good. And let's now talk briefly about that. Okay, before that, why don't we take a quick break and then take attendance? It's been a while since we have done that. Yeah, just get yourself ready, and then we'll take attendance, and we'll talk about dynamic type. I think we should be able to maybe move on to typecasting today a little bit. We should be able to, okay. Yeah, get your device ready, and then I'll start a class. Okay, start a class over here. And the poll. Yeah, check in, please. And as usual, if you got any trouble, don't wait. Just come over to the front, and then you can put your name on the sheets. All right? Everybody seems to be okay, right? Good. I'll wait for another 20 seconds, and then I will close the poll. Awesome. Everybody's good? Right. All right, guys, take a two minutes break. Okay, get yourself refreshed. Okay. Yeah, two minutes. Don't go too far. Do you have a pen? Yeah, get your pen, please. Okay, one more minute, and then we'll resume. We got 30 minutes to go for today. You'll go fast, don't worry. Okay, let's now resume. All right, let me just uh, quit from eye clicker. Okay, alrighty. Okay, before we talk, uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about dynamic type. Yeah, I'll get to this page in just one moment. So far, we have spoken about static types only. What's really static type? Again, very quick recap, just in case. Whenever you have declaration for a reference variable, this is the static type, which we emphasize for so much, right? Static type. And now we're going to add in dynamic type. That's why things can get a little bit confusing. But whenever you get confused, always remember this page. Let me show it to you over here. When should you consider static type? When, you, when I ask you whether a line should compile or not. And when should you consider dynamic type, which I'm going to talk about. Whenever you want to analyze the runtime behavior of the code, right? Just remember that principle. And Following that principle, you will be all right. Let's now get to this. Okay, let me go over some slides and I'll show you some visualization tip, which will be also useful when we talk about casting, maybe a little bit later. Okay, a reference variable dynamic type is a type of the objects that it is currently pointing to at a runtime. Meaning that if you actually say reference variable points to an object box, the title of the box is the dynamic type. And Dynamic type may change 
for as often as you like. Whereas for static type, once it's declared, you can never change it, never, ever. For dynamic type, change as you wish. That's why things get a little bit tricky, okay? And there are two possible ways to reassign the dynamic type, which I'll show you just by example, okay? Let's now talk about how you can visualize uh, the two types. Let's say, for example, we declare S to be of type students. Right away, you should really identify the students over here is the static type. And you can think about whenever you see the new keyword, it's about creating a new object in the memory and let S store its address, right? This one is dynamic type. Because at the runtime, you may change the address that's stored in S for as often as you like. Whenever, whenever you change the address that's actually stored in here, potentially you're modifying the dynamic type. Okay, so that's dynamic type for now. Sometimes it would be actually beneficial in your diagram, for example, you see this, uh, that's what we have been doing. You know, S is pointing to some objects dynamically resident students. But sometimes you might find a need to also put the static type alongside over here. You might find a need sometimes, okay? So I'm just telling you, sometimes you may want to consider. This will be the static type, and this one here, resident students, is dynamic type, okay? And here is just some tips about how to use the two types, which we'll see. Static type is just about expectation, and also dynamic type is just about which version of the method you might call. We'll see that, okay? We'll see examples. Let's now take a look if I miss anything here. Okay, so there are two possible ways to change the dynamic type. Let me show you the easier way. The easier way is simply got the new keyword over here, okay? Let's say, for example, Let's say this. You can see here we got Jim declared to be students statically. And we can dynamically change the Jim's that dynamic type to either this or this. Whenever you have a new keyword, that means you have a new dynamic type for the objects you are assigned to. Okay? And let me just mark that first. You can think about this would be some dynamic type. Number one, dynamic type number one. And this will be just another dynamic type. This will be dynamic type number two. And I, I will visualize in just a moment. But what should be the rule for assigning a new dynamic type to the variable? Not surprisingly, this new dynamic type, for example, resident students, must be able to fulfill what's expected on the static type of students, which means this class over here must be a descending class of the static type over here. That's what you will see on the slide. I'll write it down here. The rule. The new dynamic type must fulfill the expectations on the reference variables static type. Meaning that this dynamic type here must be a descending class of students. In this case, resident students is a descending class of student for sure. So that's why this is okay, all right? So that means the new dynamic type is a descending class. of the reference variables static type, right? So both of these are valid. Resident students is a, descend, a descending class of students. And also non-resident students is also a descending class of students. So both are fine, okay? One more thing to say, which we actually also visualized last time. If you think about what's really changing over here, when we say Jin is assigned to this, 
So that means Jim is pointing to, at the runtime, some objects over here, dynamically, is resident students. Okay? So right after this point, right after this point, dynamic type of Jim is resident students. After you try to execute, let's say here, this variable assignments, after this, right after this point, dynamic type of Jim changes to non-resident students. Because what this variable assignment does is, rather than pointing to here, it's actually pointing to just a new object over here of type non-resident students. So what you should really notice is, it's a very simple example here, mainly tells you how you can change the dynamic type by using a new keyword. Are we okay with this? Okay. The second way is actually not too much difficult. You just have to know how to trace, uh, how to draw a diagram. Actually, this is good. All right. Quick test for you guys. Is this okay? Yes, go ahead. That was not because... It's not a descendant class of resident. Yes, that was quite obvious. Very good. Thank you. Not valid. Two ways you can justify. Number one, students is not a descendant of resident student. This is not a descendant of resident student, number one. Number two, more intuitively, students cannot fulfill the expectations of resident student. That's another way to see that. All right? And later on, I'm going to give you guys some practice questions for written test number, uh, number four. Right, for, the, uh, for the final written test, which will cover inheritance. In that case, you should ought to know how to justify. I'll give you guys a question and standard answer. You can further verify your understanding. Okay, so, okay, quickly. Is this okay? Good. Huawei, I've, uh, Huawei P50 Pro is over here. My phone static type Android is over here. Uh, indeed, this is, is a descending class of that. So that should be okay, right? So we can put check, all right? What about this one here? Can I change this? Okay, so here, how do we judge? This one here is Galaxy S21 Plus, uh, S21 over here. And my phone was declared to be Android over here. Is this a descending class of that? It is. So that's why it should also be fine. All right. That's something you guys really want to get mechanical and quick. Okay? Practice. Another exercise. All right? More. How about this? Yes or no? For this one. The first one. Can I assign iOS to be Huawei P50 Pro? I cannot, right? Hopefully, hopefully you guys are just bored because it's too easy. Then I'll be very happy. Just bear with me. I just want to make sure everybody's okay. Huawei P50 Pro over here. Is it a descendant class of iOS? No, no way. All right? So cross check. Okay? For what it's worth, Galaxy S21 is here. My phone is still iOS over here. Is this a descending clause of that? Also no. Okay, you guys really got the idea. Do I have more? No. Okay. That's approach number one, to change the dynamic type using new keyword. Approach number two is nothing too new. It's basically just about tracing. Whenever you do variable assignment to see where the arrow is going to point to. New, uh, after the variable assignment. Let's take a look. We can just do examples directly. And that's actually something we did last time. Okay? So here, you can see we got one, two, and three. 
we got three variables over here. And you can check by yourself individually, this will be okay, this will be okay, and this will be okay. The reason is actually quite trivial because this is a descending class of itself, and similarly, okay? And now what we want to do is to check, let me give you different timings. Timing number one, timing number two, okay? And then timing number three, one, two, and three. We got three timings. Timing number one is right before we try to do this variable assignments, okay? Timing number two is right after we have done the variable assignments. Timing number three is right after we have done the second variable assignments. Now, we want to know after each, uh, at each one of the, the three timings, what will be the dynamic type of Jin? Let me look at the table. So we have Jin, static type. Let's look at this. So Jim's static type, and also Jim's dynamic type. And we got three timings. One, two, and three. Let's fill out the table to understand, okay? Then why don't we start with the static type? What would that be? Absolutely. Once, yep, once it's declared, never change. So this part over here will just be the same. Okay, what about the dynamic type for Jim? For timing number one. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, because it will just correspond to this one over here. That's the initial assignments. So that will be just students. So that means Jin after the initial one is pointing to just a students. What about timing number two over here? Marcus, go ahead. Resident students, that was good. And for what's worth, let's visualize very quickly, just for this one. Because we got RS initially is pointing to resident students, RS is pointing to so resident students, after this variable assignment over here, Jim is actually going to point to this resident students. So we have modified its dynamic type to be RS. Very good. And for the final one, I'm pretty sure you guys will know. What about timing number three? Yes, non-resident student, because we'll simply say, rather than pointing to here, it's going to point to wherever NRS if you look at NRS, should be pointing to some non-resident students that should be where Jim should be pointing to right now. Okay, so that'll be NRS. Very simple example, but that's kind of the, what you're expected to operate, right? Do we have any question here? Okay, and of course, one more remark. When you actually try to invoke Jim the get tuition, which version of get tuition? Well, you can see get tuition here, uh, get tuition here, get tuition here, and get tuition over here. We got three different versions. In order to determine which version is gonna be invoked, we wanna see what's the dynamic type of gym. At this point, it's timing number two. So that would be resident students is dynamic type. So that means call this version over here corresponding to dynamic type. Marcus. Does that always happen with overridden methods? Like whenever you change the dynamic type of uh, ancestors? Yes, indeed, indeed. So uh, let me just ref uh, kind of repeat uh, what Marcus just, would just ask. So whenever you have a method call over here, if you know that Jim statically was declared to be a student, you gotta watch out. Because according to the hierarchy, students at the runtime might have resident students or non-resident student, or even student itself as the dynamic type. So either version is actually okay, depending on what the dynamic type is. Yes, okay, so finally, if you look at this one over here, again, you're calling gym.getTuition. 
because after timing number three over here is NRS. So we know that NRS is dynamic type, meaning that we're going to call this version instead. Okay? Are we okay so far? Okay. Uh, okay, I think uh, this one here, uh, let me see if there's any repetition here. Student, residents, students. Aha, okay, how about this one here? Which version are we going to call? And which version are we going to call? That's a final exercise before we move on. Two questions. Ah. Yes, I agree. You cannot even decide which version it's going to call because it's not even going to compile. Marcus, can you go a little bit further? Why would RS equals gen not going to compile? Yes, exactly. Exactly. So over here, okay, this is not even going to compile. And let's, let me just write down the reason for one more time. The static type of gym, which is students, not descendants of the static type of the left hand side, RS, which is Resident students. Students here, residents here. So is this a descendant of that? No. Okay, good. Be careful. Okay. Okay, a final summary slide before we can get to the typecasting just for a little bit. Okay, we might have some time. Okay, says so something we just talked about, polymorphism, dynamic binding. You know what, guys, I would suggest this will be a very nice page for recap. How about I save this page just for Wednesday in the beginning? I'll suggest we save that. Let me move on to typecasting directly. This one, don't worry, I'm going to do that on Wednesday in the beginning to summarize. I want to move on to typecasting just for 10 minutes or less. And for your study, I'm going to include an announcement today. For this slide, you can read it, feel free. Nothing new, but I would like to use that as a recap on Wednesday. And then all the other, uh, the next slide 50, slide 51, and also 53 over here. So these are just some extra example until 54. You can look at, okay? Nothing, uh, nothing new over here. It's just to re-emphasize uh, re about static type, dynamic type. Okay, so you, you guys can definitely study up to here. And let's now start a little bit with the typecasting. Okay, let me do that. Let me present a little problem to you. Okay, let's look at that. Let's say this, right? Remind you, we got a student hierarchy here. We got Jin, declared to be students, resident student. And we know that this will be okay, right? Resident students is a descendant class of students. So this one is fine. So what we have is, for this line, Jin pointing to a resident students with the name over here. Jin Davis. And we got another line over here, resident students is assigned to Jin. Can we do that? Because what I intend to do, let me tell you what I intend to do. I want to say RS, I really want to set a premium rates. Oh, sorry. Let me go back a little bit. I should have presented a little bit better. Let me do it again. Beg your pardon. When I said this one is actually valid because resident students is a descending class of student. And when you visualize resident student, it's really important for you to know what attributes to uh, include. And for sure, we got name over here, and also we got everything here, and what's important is resident student also got premium rate. So don't forget, you should really include 
the premium rates. And something to note, Jin declared to be a student. And it has a dynamic type resident students. But you can see now the static type, dynamic type, they are different, but it's valid, okay? Let's now move on to the next line. The next line here, I say, I really want to set the premium rates for this RS. I really want to. The way I want to do it is, I want to say I have another variable called RS. I want to let RS point to this object here by doing this variable assignments and then set the premium rate to be 1.5. That's what I really intend to do. It also makes sense because if this is already a resident student's object, I should be able to use RS pointing to it and set it. But can we do that as far as compilation is concerned? Marcus? So, yes, because each set RS is uh, so you, you think we can do it or we cannot? Mm, okay, anybody else? Jasmine? Mm -hmm. Okay, to be more precise, let's take a look. Jim over here has the static type students, as you can see from here. And RS over here is resident students, right? So now, can you actually assign students to resident students? You can only do it if students was a descendant class of resident student, but it was not. So this is not possible. All right, so this is not good, okay? Now, this kind of presents a very sound limitation about what Eclipse will allow you to do. Let me rephrase it. We as developer, we know that Jin indeed is pointing to a resident student's objects. And we really want to set its premium rate to be PR. But part of the expectation of uh, students does not include premium rate, so we cannot do it. So what I need to do is I want to use RS as a resident student to set it. So I, I want to let it point, to, point there. But as we explained, according to the substitution rule, we cannot do it because students' static type is not a descending class of resident students, so we cannot do it. So the compiler somehow has been very conservative, very reserved about doing this. That's really a limitation. But there is a way to overrule the decision for the compiler, which is called typecasting. Okay? That's something we can do. And related to the limitation of a compiler, usually at this point, we got five minutes, that should be enough. I want to present an A plus challenge for the course. Okay? I'm gonna present you A plus challenge is, oh, everybody know, I got your attention, okay? I'm going to present you a little problem here. If you have a present a solution to me at the end of the semester with a solution, you will get A plus right away for the course. I don't care what you did before, I'll give you A plus right away if you got a solution. Sounds good deal, right? Let's look at what the problem is, okay? Okay, let's take a look. Okay, here's the problem, okay? If you can write to me a program, you can write it in Python, you can write it in Java, whatever, you can write it in C, okay? So here's what the pro uh, program should do. Your program is going to take two simple inputs. You can take some Java program, my class.java, I'll give you some example, and then it's going to take another variable name. And all your program got to tell me is, what's the last dynamic type? of this particular variable. For example, my class.java can be just this program here. You can think about my class.java is simply here. Oh, sorry. And s is simply a variable over here. You can see somehow we declare s over here. The very last dynamic type should be resident students. In that way, the return value from your program should just be resident students. Right? Sounds pretty easy, right? You can write such a program. If you can write this program to me in any language, you definitely got A plus for this course. 
wait a moment. Is this really possible? Okay, let me, let me tell you guys, that's why I want to spend just the first few, uh, last few minutes just for, for you to understand. What I just presented to you is a very classic problem, something called undecidable problem. If you could solve this problem here, what you deserve is not A+. Plus. You deserve a Nobel Prize, <laughs> not just A+. Plus, okay? So, well, I wouldn't give you A plus that easy, right? You gotta earn it, but that's okay. Now, only for your information, that's why I wanna spend the last two minutes give you guys some idea. For those of you, uh, uh, if you guys are in the engineering discipline, you wouldn't take this course, but if you're in CS, so there is a class, uh, course called ECS 2001, Introduction to the Theory of Computation. So there is certain thing that computer just cannot perform. They just cannot do it, okay? This is one example of what a computer can, cannot do, which is to really figure out the dyna dynamic type or in more generally, the dynamic behavior of a program. It just cannot be done, okay? So it's undecidable to figure out the dynamic behavior of a program. And why am I talking about this? There's a reason for that. Because remember in the last page, I tried to really present in a way to say that Java compiler is so unflexible. Even though you know pretty well, Jim is really pointing to your resident students. Still, it wouldn't allow you to simply let RS pointing to RS because the substitution rule wouldn't work. It's because in general, at this point, compiler just cannot figure out the dynamic type for Jim is really resident students. In general, it's simply not possible. That's why it wouldn't allow you to do that. In order to really overwrite uh, this rule over here, we need something called typecasting, okay? However, once we start the typecasting on Wednesday, you're gonna see typecasting can be also tricky because number one, you want to see which direction you want to do typecasting. Either you want to cast upwards or downwards. We'll talk about it. And number two, whenever you want to do typecasting, in this case, you want to figure out what the dynamic type is by yourself on the paper so that you wouldn't run into the so-called class cast exception. Okay, that's something we'll see on Wednesday. And don't try this problem here. It just cannot be done, but it's good for you to know about what your compiler cannot do. Thank you so much. I'll see you on Wednesday. And for sure, I'll see you tomorrow for the programming test. Take care.